Welcome to Act React, a podcast where we explore improvisation through conversations with remarkable artists. I'm the host, Daniel Burkholder, a dance artist based here in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, the ancestral and unceded lands of the Ho-Chunk, Menominee, and Potawatomi peoples. And in this episode, I have the pleasure of sharing my conversation with Keith Hennessy. I remember first seeing Keith perform with Contraband, a seminal dance company from San Francisco. I saw them in the mid 1990s when I was working at Dance Place in Washington, DC. A couple of years later, um, I, did, I moved to San Francisco and seeing that concert and getting to know Keith and a number of other artists from San Francisco was the reasons that I really made that move. While living in the Bay Area, I every Tuesday night, I went to 848 Community Space, where there was always a contact improv class followed by a jam. Often, the jam would go very late into the night, and it was where I really got to dig deep into that practice. Keith is someone that I've always seen as a visionary, a provocateur, and a really thoughtful and visceral artist, so it's really great to have him on the podcast. Before we jump into our conversation, here's a little bit about Keith. Keith Hennessy, MFA, PhD, is a dancer, writer, choreographer, witch, and teacher. Raised in Canada, living in Ramatush Ohlone Territory, San Francisco, since 1982, he tours widely. Using improvisation, ritual, collaboration, and protest, Keith and instigates queer embodied experiences that respond to political crisis and heartbreak. Hennessy directs Circo Zero, co-founded the Performance Cultural Spaces 848 and Counterpulse, and was a member of Sarah Mann's Contraband from 1985 to 1994. Awards include a Guggenheim, a New York Bessie, U.S. Artists, and a few Bay Area Isidore Duncan Awards. Now, please enjoy our conversation. So, hey, Keith, thanks so much for joining me on my little podcast. Um, uh, I'm I, super glad to be here. Yeah, awesome. It's been, it's been a while since we've seen each other. Um, but of course, yeah. always following you a little bit on social media as, as we were just talking about. Um, and I'm, you know, thinking about artists this season who I, I wanted to have a conversation with, like you just like were right up at the top of that list. I've, you know, I can remember seeing your, you first meeting you actually with Contraband um, back in the 1990s when you came to Dance Place in Washington, D.C. And I was, I was the tech director there. And um, so that was a that was a minute ago, and um, and then I I think the biggest impression in terms of improvisational work is when you and Patrick and Ishmael came through with um, unsafe unsuited, mm -hmm. and and I got the pleasure of actually running the lights, improvising the lights with you all for that performance. I don't. You may not remember that, but I remember really, really, actually, it's one of the performances I remember at Dance Place kind of most clearly, I think, in my memory. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, it's one of the treats of that work was to get to each place and let the lighting and sound people give them very loose uh, guidelines and then let them improvise with us. Yeah. I, I think actually for one of the performances, at least, I was like, oh, that seems like an ending. And I faded the lights out and you all were like, that is not the ending. And you like kept going in the dark for a while. And I was like, okay, I guess I'm bringing lights back up because we're not ending. <laughs> yeah. Well, awesome. I love a transparent process. <laughs> yeah, totally. So I guess my kind of my first real question to you is thinking about improvisation and I know this is kind of a big, broad, open question, but how, how does improvisation like show up in your work and in your life these days? Mm, big question. Yeah. Um, I think earlier in my, both my career and my life um, and the overlaps between them, I was really foregrounding improvisation. Like I identified as an improviser. I was very big on the applications of artistic improvisational practices in everyday life mm. um, and vice versa. Um, and I think now I just kind of take it for granted. Like, you know, um, 
I very recently I spent about a year long process doing with my small nonprofit doing a a racial equity inspired or motivated um, strategic planning process. And one of the things we had to do is do a statement of values. And you know, you do a value like anti-racist, um, queer affirming, but we also had values like experimentation was a value and improvisation were values. And so it was really interesting to sort of look at improvisation and its relationship to experimental art practices in general. Um, as a guideline for ethical living. Hmm. Um, and I don't think that's a requirement for all people, but I do think that when we foreground our flexibility, our ability to respond in the moment, um, our attention to sort of awareness details in a way that expands beyond um, you know, one body's kinesphere into the social space. Um, I just really value those practices. And I think that doing them in outside of the studio speaks to doing them inside the studio. And the studio practices are foundational to being able to do them outside the studio. Not unlike someone who's a meditator every day and those awareness practices of them sitting or walking, uh, you know, in contemplation um, is something they carry with them through the whole day. I think that um, many of us who are improvisers in the studio or in the performance context, we bring those practices of awareness and relationality into mm. our, um, our other work and relations and personal lives and intimate lives and political lives. Yeah, that's a beautiful, way of describing it and answering and i'm wondering if we can just dig in just a, a little bit more about like yeah. what that what that really looks like in the practical sense you know like maybe first start in the studio like when you're practicing improvisation like in the studio or on the stage what are the kind of values or frameworks um that you find really valuable to, to create that environment that you're looking for? Well, I think that, you know, like for example, in the in recent years, consent has really started to be foregrounded, um, especially around contact improvisation spaces um, that center touch as uh, integral to the dancing. But I think in general, it's happening, right? And yeah. And when consent is being looked at as a larger picture, we're also looking not just at what can happen between individuals in the room, but also what is the power structure that's in the room? Is it a class? Is it a choreography? Um, are there funders? Are there, is there a school that's overlooking it? And then how much do people get to choose in or uh, negotiate those working conditions? So we're, we're thinking about consent in all those ways. And I think that people who have been trained through improvisation in ways similar to myself, it's like, we look at, political issues of respect and artistic issues of curiosity as mm. central to the foundations of trust and consent that we might have. Like the consent needs to be based in this mutual respect that we have for each other. Um, and the consent also like to really negotiate difference and disagreement with people, we have to be curious. And so I feel like practices that inspire curiosity and are actually rigorous, like the rigorous discipline of curiosity. Like, you know, I'm often with students being like, if you're bored, find something new to be curious about, like get interested in it um, rather than think that you've already figured out your positionality in relation to it. So curiosity is, I see it as a, a political intervention. I see it as a gateway to um, actual like respectful, consensual, negotiated relationships. Um, okay. I'm very much into the notion of negotiation. Um, and I think I called a piece negotiate back in 2011, but I've been working with the idea in classes ever since. And I think that, and when I think about negotiation, I just mean this relationship is up for discussion. 
Hmm. We're not assuming that we already know what it is. And one of the things about negotiation is that it's very improvised. You don't set your conditions and then meet them. It's like you set your conditions, you hear the other person's needs, fears, desires, doubts, conditions, and then you start having to figure out how you can work together, how you can dance together, how you can, um, I don't know, whatever your motivation is. Like, yeah. I'll often be like, love has to be somewhere in your foundational goals, right? So when when everything else is falling apart, it's like, how are we bringing more love into the world? How are we figuring out how to love ourselves and each other? How are we figuring out how to love those who are different from us, whatever, you know? Yeah. But curiosity, for example, which I feel improvisational practices really activate, that that curiosity speaks to all of these kinds of needs, like political, social needs, um, but also the the creative experimentation needs. Yeah, so that, that would be one one place. Yeah, that's that's wonderful. I have a, I have a follow up question, but it actually it reminded me of a, a, a short, a, a little story from when I was in high school. I used to have a, a teacher that just really loved to poke people. It was, she was an English teacher and we would be reading a book or something and someone would complain that it was a boring book. And her little like right. phrase, she would always say is like, all books are not as boring as their readers. And, and I mean, she was getting, I think, you know, she was being kind of sarcastic in that, but I think she was pointing to that same thing is like, your job is to be interested in the book, right? Yeah. Like, like to be curious, like don't, you can't be yeah. boring. So it's an interesting kind of thing. Um, my question I mean, it's tricky when the book, it's tricky when the book is a nonfiction, because that's when I'm like, you now need to bring a non-boring practice to it. You need to start reading backwards. You need to re skip ahead a chapter. But these don't work sometimes when it's a school assignment. I think yeah, yeah, I yeah, think yeah. I didn't fully get empowered around that kind of practice until I was a doctoral student when it's like, mm. there's no way to read all the books that you could read. <laughs> and so you have to slow read this one and experimentally read this one and only read the intros to these two. Um, yeah. You know, and you again have to activate your curiosity in the thing. But I, I say this about duets. I'm like, people will be duetting and I'll want it to continue longer. And I'm like, if you notice that you're bored, that's on you. Right. Like, get curious about something, um, go into extreme slow motion, close your eyes, like, do something to shift your state. Mm -hmm. um, you know, practice certain kinds of refusal, but stay present, you know. Um, but yeah, I, I think boring is very interesting. It's, um, I don't know that I've ever been bored. And most of the time that people say they're bored, I don't believe them. <laughs> uh -huh. um, I think they're annoyed, they're angry, they're sad, they're, yeah. um, they're, they're tired. Mm -hmm. Um so yeah yeah how it is terrible that i just went on to a recording and said i don't believe my students but anyway here we go <laughs> <laughs> reframing their experience helping that helping them reframe their experience right um no no i fully don't believe them i think that i think we've fallen into a lot of lazy language and <clears throat> saying we're bored of things is a way to not critique Interesting, yeah. And so what I want is for people to actually go deeper either into themselves or the situation mm -hmm. and find what's not compelling them about this situation. Right. Yeah. yeah. That that kind of curiosity is, right. I always feel like when I go to a dance concert and if it's not kind of like, whatever, my cup of tea, that's when I learn most about what I know about dance is by like, oh, what is going on here that that I'm not engaging with? And like, what what can I engage with? And what are those elements that I want? Like when I think about yeah. as a teacher, the performer, I want to carry, if I'm just totally into the performance, often I have like, that's when it's that kind of like, oh, maybe later I can dissect at some point, but in the moment I'm just with it. It's it's the opposite yeah. when, the, when it's not fulfilling whatever I want it to be at the moment. And I'm like, oh, yeah. that, it's me, I need to look at this more closely or go dive deeper into it mm -hmm. or whatever the thing yeah. is.
So no, I love that moment. There are some performances I, I see a lot. Yeah. And there are some performances that truly are not generative for me. Yeah. And maybe I just couldn't rise to the occasion to find that. But often, whether I think it's good or bad, right? They're generative in exactly the ways that you're talking about. Yeah. You um you project other things into it. You um by critically engaging in it, you notice what you like and don't like, or um, you know, you realize that you've stepped away from the people who are there, and then you can start to look at what that is, like what has happened to your to your gaze in a way. Like, yeah. um, so I I find it fascinating, you know. So, great. So thinking about this idea of curiosity and that that creates a space for things to be more flexible. And and maybe mm -hmm. about kind of as as kind of um, solid. Um, how does that manifest itself? I'm just curious. Like this, just thinking about running your nonprofit, and you're kind of. If I'm understanding this, you're more or less the the director of it, and you have you make performances. You have people working for you. How does this idea of curiosity and kind of flexibility come to play within that kind of context? I mean, play, we didn't mention until you just said it right now. And, um, yeah, I, I guess that play is super central to my approach to um, life and art and life art. Um, and I'll just say yesterday I was in rehearsal with someone who is a new collaborator. And so we're a lot just finding who we are. And um, and like many of my projects, it's a piece that is about um observing the gap of racial difference and also bridging racial difference and when when to bridge and when to just stand on either side of the gap and and notice with as much curiosity and respect as you can so you know i was in the studio uh with this new collaborator and she said yeah for her she always says to people she's also done a lot of teaching she says to students you know making work is two thirds relationship building, one third creativity. Like we spend two thirds of our time just building the relationship. And then if we build a relationship, then we can make the piece in the third of the time that's remaining. Yeah. So I think that yeah. these notions about curiosity and negotiation and, um, and playing in these spaces are really about the building of the relationship. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I think you know, I've worked a lot with this um, this anarchist theorist who every time I go to, I say that, I forget his name, um, but uh, it's in my notes somewhere really specific. Um, he's German. He was an anarchist at the turn of the last century. Um, and anyway, his name will come to me. Okay. We can put it in the notes of this. Oh, yeah. Gustav Landauer. Gustav Landauer. And one of the things that Landauer said, you know, a, a, a basic anarchist position, right, is that um, the state is a problem and we want to destroy it. So um, we could talk forever about what we think the state is or what structures of oppression look like. But his thing is, if you want to destroy the state, you have to recognize that the state is not an object. It's a network of relationships. It's a system of relationships. And if you really want to destroy things, and he has a thing of like, you can throw a chair through a window and break the window, but the window will be rebuilt. Um, what you really need, what if we actually want to create like the other world that's possible, we actually have to treat each other differently. We have to behave differently towards one another. Mm -hmm. And so I look at the studio practice as a place to work on this idea, which mm -hmm. is here we have this space that's set up for experimentation, for improvisation, for curiosity, for respect, for awareness practices, um, for play. And that's how we're going to develop new relational practices that we, if, it's, if the project is moving towards performance, that we then share with publics. If the practice is just, um, we're in training, we don't know exactly what for, then these become sort of life art hacks, right? That we're going to develop new ways to be with each other through play, through improvisation, mm -hmm. uh, through spontaneous 
playful negotiation of how to live in a moment together. Mm -hmm. um, and this is a kind of political activity. It's studio-based political activity. Yeah, that's great. That That's a nice maybe segue into, um, of course, I wanted to talk more about how this relationship between the art you make and the improvisation and the politics that you embody so beautifully, I think. Um, and, you know, often when I kind of, what I know of you and the work that I've seen of yours and um, and somewhat from a distance, like those the politics and personal and art and improvisation, it's all, it's not even woven together. It feels like it is of the same kind of cloth in yeah. a way. And so I'm curious if you could just speak to that and how those inform one another um, support one another, challenge one another? You know, it's hard to not speak from the present moment. And now I'm 63 years old and I've been saying things like this since I was 20. Um, <laughs> and the, and what I mean by pointing to how, you know, these last 40 years have changed me is that there are so many um, on, there are so many new developments in theory, in political theory <laughs> over these 40 years. So, yeah. Right now, we might be looking more at indigenous cosmologies of how all things are connected to respond to the problem of the Western mind that creates disciplines, right? Mm -hmm. um, the idea that life and art are separate, the idea that political activity, creative activity, and raising children are separate activities. Mm -hmm. um, you know, um, so. I've always thought they all belong together and that the disciplinary divisions are fake. Mm -hmm. I use dance as a home base. Um, I'm happy and even proud to say I'm a dancer. Um, there was a time when I thought it would no longer be useful to say that. Um, and I think that was coming also from a place of hurt, of feeling like the dance world excluded me as much as I was excluding it. Um, I used to get turned down for grants all the time because my work was not dance. Um, and I would just write back and be like, I've literally never done anything else. <laughs> right. Like, like if you think there's another category of activity for me to apply for a grant in or another, um, you know, career choice where I could use these skills, let me know. But it kind of looks like dancing, you yeah. know, is the way. So, but then I think, as my self-confidence grew and my networks of solidarity grew within dance worlds and um, also reputation, esteem, you know, whatever. Um, and the idea that, you know, I say this about Christians all the time, if the liberal and politically left Christians don't claim Christianity, then it's lost to the, um, to the hate Christians, basically. Um, so, you know, I kind of think that way about dance, you know, in different moments of my life. Like, if people like me don't say we're dancers, then it belongs to people who um, only dance frontally on a proscenium stage. And um, we shouldn't give it to them. We should be in dialogue with them and, like, not even oppositional, although at times I am, but in other times, just like, let's actually be curious and look at these gaps of difference and um, negotiate playful spaces of new relations between us, you know, yeah. whatever. Um, so all of that to say that there's many ways to think of that everything is already connected and that the effort to divide by um, discipline or realms of human behavior or uh, areas of study, I find it super weird at the level of study, right? Um, and again, probably our best examples of people who are theoretically helping us through this are indigenous scientists or indigenous feminists. Um, you know, people who are thinking through multiple time spaces at once, or like you even take something that's almost hit pop status, like the book Braiding Sweetgrass, right. um, you know, whose author just won a MacArthur Award, like, and, you know, she's not a young person. So it's like, it's a lifetime of achievement for her to get that. But Part of the recognition is how many people are reading Braiding Sweetgrass and appreciating someone who can say, well, there's an indigenous creation myth of what sweetgrass is. And then there's actual plant biology that can tell you what this plant is. And then there's ways of studying 
uh, colonialism to look at how plants that grow in one place maybe didn't used to grow there. And all three of these stories, right, the political scientist, the biology, like this, the pure science, um, and then the indigenous knowledge, which has always been a transdisciplinary project, come together. And I think that I feel very affirmed reading these kinds of things. Um, one of my earliest influences, you know, from the white Western canon is Buckminster Fuller, uh -huh. who also tried to refuse disciplinary categories, um, mm -hmm. separations of art, life, separations of architecture from science, from ecology, from human behavior, from human relationships, right? So I was exposed to him when I was probably 12 or 13 years old. And then, you know, I became uh, politically an anarchist by my late teens, you know, probably by 19. Um, so I've never accepted that we're supposed to separate all these things out. They, they've ne it's never made sense in my body. And then as someone who's, you know, very much a political animal and engaged in mm -hmm. these kinds of questions of how does power flow and how does it not flow and who, who retains it, things like that. Um, I've just like, I've never seen the, the disciplinary category project as anything other than oppressive project that um, needs to go, you mm -hmm. know? Yeah, yeah. And that there's a lot of support. There's a lot of cultural support from any of our histories. Like we don't have to look at somebody else's indigeneity um, as a way out of it. Although I think there is a lot of beauty and support coming from the people who, you know, the knowledge bearers of, of indigenous knowledge who are, um, whose knowledge is now accessible to all of us. Right. You know, there's a lot to learn there. So, yeah, that's some hits on it. Yeah. That's... I've always just done it. Yeah, that's great. I mean, it's, it's really wonderful. And I think like the other, the other thing that I, I, you know, I was kind of like, of course, rereading some things or looking at some things and, and along this line, and I think this kind of speaks to everything that you were just talking about is the, the way that you uphold your work as collaboration. And mm -hmm. you know, even here, you know, reading some things, you'd be talking about how you you maybe instigated the thing, but so much of it is happens because of the people in the room, and that it becomes yeah. something really different because of them. Yeah, I I think my biggest choreographic contribution is that I set the conditions for art making to happen. Mm -hmm. I don't actually choreograph the art yeah um and i don't even choreograph the process of the making of the art but i do choreograph the conditions for the making of it um and some of that work looks like production right mm -hmm. like grant writing running a nonprofit, um raising money for good ideas um the relationship building that support that inspires the good ideas um but yeah, in the end, it's like, that's what I'm the most interested in. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, there's a caveat to that, but I would say what I'm the most interested in is um, both creatively and politically is how to collaborate across lines of difference. Mm. The caveat is that sometimes this can be um, not only tiring work, but sometimes it can be unappreciated work, like outside sure. of the micro context that you're in and that's when I go um to the beach and dance by myself and then I stay up really late at night um sewing patches of fabric together and then I realize there's a solo coming out of this and then I do a solo performance right. and you know even my most recent solo has all kinds of collaboration within it you know with costume designers and sound artists and I only worked with friends and built you know it was all coming out of my relationships during COVID um at the same time, it's really a solo piece as a kind of recentering and respite from um, the overextending through community that collaborative projects sometimes demand. Yeah. Um, so, also, I'm a Scorpio. So, you know, one of the things about Scorpios is that half of our world, you know, is underground. We don't share it with anyone. So, People see me and they see this extremely public self. Um, I'm prolific, I'm out there, I see the shows, I make the shows. But half the time I 
need to be in retreat or be underground or be invisible. So the solos come out of those kind of processes. Mm. Um, mm. That, that's really, but that's, they also just in a yeah. sense create, they create the personal conditions for me to enter the next giant collaboration. Sure. That makes know, sense. And even like, again, I'm working with this, uh, another new collaborator um, who comes from uh, a more technical dance training world. And like I said earlier, before, before we were recording, you know, is very familiar with the practice of making phrases and that choreography is about making phrases and stringing them together and then starting to play with them through time. And she was pointing out how liberating it is to work with frequent collaborators, know that you have the choreography down, mm -hmm. uh, the ensemble work down, and then what opens up energetically. And we were talking and she was looking at, you know, this piece turbulence that I worked on for almost 10 years. That's an extremely messy, open, free work of improvisation. And she was trying to figure out like how you get there. Like, how do you trust people? How do you let it, you know? And I was like, oh, wow, I don't trust all of those people. That's actually not what, it, we're actually building our tolerance muscles. We're building our curiosity muscles. Uh, we're building our respect muscles. In that piece, crazy shit happened. Like it was two hours long. The audience would sometimes leave and we would not stop, you know, like um, uh, that. What we're working on there is something way bigger than um, I don't know what sometimes people think that is supposed to a dance or a performance is supposed to be about. Like mm -hmm. we're, we were creating real time experiences um, and modeling new ways to be, including what happens if three things are happening at the same time because people don't want to conform to the ensemble? Like, is that still a world? Is that still a world that any of us want to live in? Um, how much tolerance for difference, disagreement, and um, parallel worlds you know, do we have? And how can we build a strength for that rather than how much do we use the studio to control what happens, right? Like, mm -hmm. Many teachers, for example, work in a way where if it's a five day class, you can't come in on day three or it's not, you can't come and go from the class. Right. And I, I respect that. There's lots of good reasons to build a container. But my thing, especially as someone who is white and male, um, is like, why would I create gateways or barriers to my class? Who cares whether people come and go? Maybe what we need to be working on is how to be more in flow with people's different needs to take care of themselves, mm -hmm. right? Um, maybe what we actually need to practice is not, maybe not a completely no bordered, no boundary situation, but like a space where the boundaries are just a little bit more open. It's not, um, you know, the class I was gonna take today, I yeah. was four minutes late going into the Zoom and they closed the door on me. <laughs> Um, and then I was like, oh, is that because this is in Germany? Um, is that because there's a lot of care around safe space and taking care of the people in it? And then I was like, wait, stop projecting. <laughs> but just notice. But anyway, I, I think there's something about being able, and again, I could only do this through improvisational practices, practices that center play and experimentation that have as a foundation respect and curiosity. Mm -hmm. um, I'm interested in what happens if the boundary around the practice is not too tight, mm -hmm. that you can sustain a guest. If the presence is strong by 10 people, who cares if two more people join? Mm -hmm. um, and, and you let them in on, if you approach with curiosity and respect, you're in. Right. Like, you know. So that's a lot of things I think about all at um, once. So I think you you're kind of talking about this already about this, but you you mentioned this idea that your job often is to create the conditions that art can be made in, you know, and and you, there's some practical things you mentioned like writing the grants, you know, those kind of kind of just practical things mm -hmm. and um, stuff like that. But is there something like you do in the studio, like okay, the grants have been written, the things that people have got the air flights, everyone's arrived at this place at this time, and now we're going into, let's say, a studio or whatever the the space is, and you're going to start the process. Is there is there things that you do to help create those conditions? 
Yeah, I've got a suitcase of um, scores and um, <clears throat> ideas to generate scores um, that I'm always carrying around and it's available. Um, there is a practice that I learned from Valentina Desideri um, that's called, she calls it fake therapy, I call it fake healing. Um, that's a practice that I've been working with for over 10 years, so I'll often bring that into a work, um, into, I mean, into a early process. Um, it's something that generates, because I do it as a trio, so it's a two-on-one healing situation. Um, the two healers are improvising and negotiating and collaborating. Um, all kinds of conversations around consent need to happen. So it's that one score is a container for many kinds of things to happen. Um, I'm very interested in how we work with issues of power and capitalism. And my gateway into that is to work with an object. So I set people up into a duet where I go, we're just going to warm up playing together. You have an object, say this phone, um, whatever the object is, it cannot transform. It has to be the same object when you're done as when you start. So if it's a phone, it has to function in exactly the same way, meaning you can't break it. Um, right. And even though there are many other ways that you and I could relate, this becomes the only, this is the primary, fo this is the point of contact. Okay. And now we start to play. And what happens is play with object opens up many other conversations. Mm -hmm. um, if you compete around the object, we start to introduce questions of power. If we uh, start to recognize the object has its own life, we enter almost these spiritual or philosophical questions, you know, around um, new materialism or animism and the life of an object. We can go into if we get concerned about breaking it, we go into the issues of value and capitalism and uh, the exploited labor that made it or the incredible resources from Africa that are in this phone that drive war making. Like, so the object making, the object dancing is a practice that I travel a lot with. Mm. And the last thing I'll say is that in, yeah. in the past, I'd say three years, a really big one has been some version of engaging with the question of land acknowledgement and ancestors. So rather than just being here and going, oh, Daniel, before we talk, I need to tell you that I'm coming to you from San Francisco, former village named Yalamu, on the unceded territories of the Ramatush Ohlone. And then we have our conversation. Right. What we've been doing, especially in the project with Ishmael Houston Jones and under the influence of the other collaborators, um, Snowflake Calvert, Jose Abad, Kevin O'Connor, um, by thinking through land acknowledgement and taking, you know, um, not one minute to say a general land acknowledgement, but take 10 minutes each and tell us who you are. Um, mm -hmm. Who are your ancestors? Um, maybe what are the um, natural, mm -hmm. like environmental landmarks where you're from and where you live now, bodies of water, um, hills, valleys, forests. Um, maybe there's particular species that really speak to where you live now and where you're from. And, um, and then get into questions of ancestry. And that process might seem rigid when we first think about what is indigenous protocol, but in fact, it's again an opening for a kind of relational improvisation. And if you revisit it repeatedly, you really start to build, um, again, in this topic of relationship building through um, and how do you do things like build trust and consent and respect and how do you get curious about each other so land acknowledgement and thinking through ancestors has been a really big practice in the last few years um, and especially to not just throw off as a um, as a form that somebody else is making me do yeah like yeah. this is what political correctness looks like it's more like Actually, outside of political correctness, what if we uh, question and critique land acknowledgement? What does that expose about us? It's like looking at the performance that you're not really responding to. Mm -hmm. What if I get curious about this and we just spend an hour here before we start moving? Right. You know? So those are some of the practices, but I've got a suitcase. Yeah, I'm, I, no doubt. <laughs> no doubt. And then I guess maybe I don't want to keep you too long this afternoon, but I guess just to kind of 
bring all of this, like you mentioned scores, we talked about, of course, improvisation and politics and life practice. And like, when you take a piece, and I know this can vary by piece, but when you like get ready to perform something, a thing, um, how much space is often, or what kind of scores do you go on into performance with? Like how, like you mentioned turbulence, which I think was very more like open. So sometimes I question that word, but we can just go say it more open yeah. um, or, you know, more constraints or what have you. Could you just maybe talk a little bit about that? So pieces are different. I think in my solo work, I actually construct scenes like, and the scene has a costume and or music and or something happens. And then within that scene, we're improvising or I'm improvising. Um, in a larger work like Turbulence, in one way, it looked like just a giant open score, as you say. But the truth is, that piece was one and a half years in development. And not just relationship building, but relationship building through studio practice. Yeah. Um, and we had a piece of cardboard on stage at all times, which had the 10 scores that we agreed should happen every performance. Okay. And it, then there was like four or five optionals that maybe happened. So one score was we would build a pyramid of three people kneeling on the ground, two people kneeling on them, and another person on top. And we would wrap all their heads in gold fabric. And that was a multivalent image um, that came from earlier works of mine, copying the torture photos of in Abu Ghraib in Iraq. Mm -hmm. um, U.S. soldiers torturing Iraqis. Right. Um, and those were originally black hoods. And then we put these gold sequin hoods on them that made it, you know, queer glam, if you want to see that. But it also was a piece about the economy. So we were looking at hierarchies of wealth and gold. And that was a score that uh, we started off in the performances early in the work we would make that pyramid. And there were 12 people on, in the cast, so any six of us could do it. We were responsible for it happening, but any six could do it, and it could happen any time in a one and a half or two hour frame. But then we started realizing, well, we could get the audience to do it. Mm -hmm. um, so that was a very improvised score how it happened, but it happened in every single show mm -hmm. for nine years. So is that an open improv? Like, no, there was all kinds of things written down. Yeah. Um, Peeing while wearing clothes was in the optionals. So it didn't happen every single show, but I'd say eight out of 10 performances, at least one person pissed their pants in the show. And then there was now a pool of piss on the stage and that then was engaged in or avoided, right? Like there were people right. who were like, I don't want anything to do with that. Yeah. Once that happens, I'm never going in that half of the stage for the rest of the show. So if you do it early, I'm out. Um, so, you know, other times there was people getting naked and rolling around in it. So like all kinds of things could happen. So I would say, yes, that was an improv, but there were proposals. They weren't necessarily scores, but there were scores or proposals that carried that work. Yeah. The most recent work with Ishmael Houston Jones and this other cast that I just mentioned, we created a lot of also we created in a sense scores or proposals and some of them happened every show and right. in between that again in any order um, although with try the piece try um, we even agreed on a beginning and an end like we had a foam machine that produced all this foam and it was an agreement among us that that would happen as the end of the piece or towards the end so that was a shaping mechanism to also a very sprawling improv, but that one was more like a one hour piece or one hour, 10 minutes. Yeah, and we so. always opened with some kind of land acknowledgement and we always ended or near ended with the foam. Yeah. So those were structures that supported uh, free spontaneous improvisational activity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's always so fascinating to me to, especially as I've been having these conversations, you know, when we say a score or a script or a structure or whatever, whatever language you use is the breadth of what people consider 
that and what things are assumed and what things are not assumed about a score. Um, oh, or things the that word they... has no, yeah, the word has no uh, coherent meaning. Yeah. And right. I think that's, I think that's fine. I know that when I think of a score, I think of uh, everyone moving backwards. There's lots of openness in that, but everyone is moving backwards. Yeah. But some people's scores are literally fragments of text or poetic things, or um, I'm going to, the score is he was pretty much fed up and kind of at the end of his rope, like a poetic line. And they'll, they'll call that a score. Yeah. And I'm like, that's not a score. That's a poetic line of inspiration. <laughs> um, but it's not important what score means. Some people will yeah. go to Anna Halperin um, as a kind of ur text on scoring. Yeah. And her sense of scoring comes from her relationship to her husband, his relationship to the histories of architecture and, you know, all the way to Bauhaus. Like, it has a very specific meaning for Anna Halperin and people who come after that. But yeah. I think for the rest of us, we make up what score means and then you tell each other what score means. And, yeah. you know, in Europe, a lot of people don't say score. They'll say proposal or a proposition. Mm, um, right. You know, yeah. sometimes it's an invitation. Yeah. Other times it's a rule or a limitation. The limit, the, the score is you can't use your legs. Right. Yeah, I like I like your your term proposal um, because it's like proposing something um, that yeah. th that could happen. And I often I, I I talk about like constraints, like if there's certain constraints, also like agreements. Okay, we've agreed that yeah. these like your ten things, like our ten agreements, we we've agreed this is going to happen. Um, and then having you know possibilities or or again proposals is nice. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. Well, Thank you so much, Q. I mean, I feel like, like I need to like talk to you like five more times to get through all of. I mean, even I barely I made all these notes and I like didn't even really do almost any of them. So, <laughs> it's, uh, well, that's typical. I am a I am an endless talker, so that's just what happens. Yeah, um, I tell you to extend right now, except that I have a um, meeting about affordable housing in five minutes. There you go. That sounds Which is one of the other places that I extend my improvisational activity into. Yeah, that's <laughs> wonderful. Great. Well, again, thank you so much for taking the time. I really appreciate it. It was great to hear your thoughts and just kind of reconnect a little bit. Yeah, really enjoyed uh, being in conversation with you. Thank you. And um, feel free to follow up. Okay, great. Thanks. <laughs> Cheers. Thank you for listening to my conversation with Keith. I hope it inspired you to think about dance, performance, and of course, improvisation in a new way. Please check out the show notes for links to Keith out in the world and on the web. And as always, please subscribe to Act React, whether you listen to us on YouTube, Apple or Google Podcasts, Stitcher or Podbean. I hope you're able to join me for my next episode with Dr. S. Amare, the founder of Embodyology, a neo-African approach to contemporary dance improvisation. It was a really fascinating conversation, and, and I'm sure you will enjoy that one as well. Until then, please take care, be well, and live spontaneously. <laughs>